Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great, the great pleasure to be with Gary Monk. He's a professor of political science and international relations at the University of Southern California. And he edited this book. It's called Critical Junctures and Historical Legacies insights and methods from for comparative social sciences. He edited this book with David Collier. And we're gonna be talking today about the book and about Gary's career. How are you, Gary? Very good. Uh, good to meet you, Javier, and uh, good to be here. I'm looking forward to a nice conversation. Great, I, I would like to start um, hearing more about your life. We were just uh, chatting um before and you were telling me that you are argentinian tell us a bit about uh how did you end up being a political scientist in the american uh, academic system how was that whole journey from buenos aires to to california Yes. Um, so we were talking offline in Spanish uh, before we started, sort of since we both um, grew up in Latin America. Uh, I grew up in, in Argentina, uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, so I grew up, I did all my, my schooling, basically primary, secondary. And um, I actually started university at the University of Buenos Aires in 1976, and I was uh, entering in sociology. Uh, this was right after the military coup of March of 1976 that really changed the university life a lot. Um, so I became disenchanted with uh, the university. I didn't finish the first year of university, so I, I kind of quit, even though I was interested in the topics to read. Um, and this was a tough period in Argentina, the, the late 1970s, it was a very repressive government. Um, I basically had to do the military service. I did that for 14 months. Then I was doing odd jobs, basically working as an artisan. Uh, so kind of drifting, not having a clear sense of direction, reading all the time. And then with a friend, we came up with the idea of doing a, a trip, hitchhiking um, throughout South America. So we, we hitchhiked through the north of Argentina, Bolivia, Peru. Um, and then at that point in time, uh, we wanted to go further north. And then we basically took a plane. Uh, I had an uncle uh, that was teaching at Dartmouth in the medical school. Um, he was a chemist by, um, sort of, that's what his PhD was in. So I went to New Hampshire to visit uh, him. So this is my first exposure to the United States. I arrived in the summer of 1980, um, and I just liked a lot what I saw I was around Dartmouth. Um, and so that made me decide to go back to university. So I hadn't done my BA. So I started to do my BA. I did it at the University of New Hampshire. Then I did a, an MA at Stanford, where you are, uh, in Latin American studies. And I did my PhD in political science at the University of California, San Diego. Um, so this wasn't a little bit like how people do it today, that they leave sort of whatever their country is to come to study in the United States. It was a bit much more by accident um, in that point in time. Um, I really loved academia, academic life here in the United States. So I would have worked hard on my PhD to be able to get a job. And my first job uh, was at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Um, and then I've been here in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. Can I ask you more about that uh, experience in, in Argentina as a student? Because you, you mentioned that you were disappointed with the university. Was this because what was happening? Was this influence of the government in the like teaching curriculum or like what, what was happening? Yeah, so... The military governments, so the two regimes, starting in the one in 1966 and then the 1976 one, uh, intervened in the university 
um, restricted the autonomy of the university, which was something that was very fundamental in Argentina. Many professors left already sort of with the coup of 1966, so people leaving to, to the exterior. Uh, people as important as Gino Germani, sort of Italian Argentine that essentially founded Argentine sociology, um, he left, he went to, to Harvard. Others left at that point in time. Um, and then sort of in what I was studying, sociology was essentially seen as Marxism from the perspective of the military regime. Um, so it was like very restricted. Um, so what had been sort of a, a university with a lot of discussion, ideas, uh, became very sort of constrained and sort of... Um, so. So it wasn't what I expected. Um, I was young at that point in time, sort of still learning about sort of the country, sort of ideas. Um, it wasn't um, something that I particularly liked. So even though I continued to be interested in, I'd always read a lot. Sort of, um, the university life in Argentina at that point in time didn't seem to be for me. The political science was something that, at least in the University of Buenos Aires, came in later with the return of democracy in 1983. Um, so sort of this is still sort of when you have the development of the social sciences uh, in Argentina at that point in time, you have more the flourishing of different disciplines with the return of democracy in 1983. And I mean, we're, I don't wanna make this uh, entire conversation about Latin America, although that would be uh, fascinating, but now that we're talking about this, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective uh, regarding um, like social science, academia or education nowadays in, in Latin America and, and in, in Argentina specifically. Uh, because I have the impression that uh, what is happening at least in, in economics in recent years is that there's like a real um, uh, like outflow of, of, of talents in, in academia from Argentina. Uh, do you perceive something similar? Are you optimistic about the future of uh, academia in Argentina? I don't know, what's, what's your impression from, from, from abroad? Yes, uh, so, so I'm actually just working on a book of, I've done several books on like intellectual history. I did one with sort of interviews with people influential in the study of politics, some sociologists in the United States. I'm doing a companion volume uh, with like 10 very influential sociologists, political scientists that really sort of shaped the field in the 60s and 70s. People like Cardoso, um, then became president uh, of Brazil, um, Guillermo O'Donnell, um, it's basically sociologists and political scientists. Uh, that was in some sense a golden generation in the 60s, 70s, when Latin America generated and I'd say even exported ideas. Um, and sort of so these were debated sort of in the United States beyond uh, beyond the, the Americas. Um, in some sense, sort of that was a, a tough period politically and you had sort of very committed uh, social scientists. Um, sort of doing their, their work. You have a big change. I mean, we really sort of from the 90s, we, we enter a very different period. You have the economic crisis um, in the 80s, sort of that really hits universities pretty hard. Um, so, so, so that's sort of an, an important change. I think you have a change then in terms of sort of how people sort of do their research. Um, the most positive trend, I'd say one positive trend, um, you have lots of people going abroad to study and then returning uh, to their country, some staying um, outside, um, really picking up the latest ideas, tools. I think we see this in economics, we see this in probably economics and political science, um, a bit in sociology, sort of, uh, that people that are sort of being educated abroad in the United States more, before it used to be more in Europe, um, and doing very fine, uh, very fine research, publishing partly in Spanish, in Brazil, in Portuguese, uh, uh, partly uh, in English. Um, what I'd say sort of 
sort of there's still issues having to do with resources in the university. Um, so I was just visiting my home country, Argentina, talking to people there. It's very hard to make a living just being a professor. So people do consulting on the side. Um, it takes time, which starts to take time away from your from your research. So having a PhD in a country even with a high degree of education like Argentina puts you in a very strong position that you manage certain knowledges. Um, so you can make money and sort of to supplement your your salary as a professor, people do that. Um, so it's hard to be sort of what we do here in the United States to be a full-time researcher. You do your teaching and basically you work with graduate students and you're doing research full-time. So, so the economic situation of universities isn't as good as in Europe or the United States. Um, and I think that basically uh, dampens the level of productivity. So you have the raw talent, people are getting their PhDs, great universities, um, sort of the working conditions um, sort of aren't as, aren't as good. But I see, I mean, sort of there's a broad group, sort of a, a large group of people sort of with uh, research skills um, that are extremely sharp, thinking about the problems of their country, engaging in debates outside. Um, so I read their works. I sort of converse with the people. I think sort of um, there's a lot, uh, a lot there. And, and what about in the U.S.? Like, so the attention of, um, of the profession here, I guess I'm, I'm thinking more than anything on, on political science regarding Latin America. Do you think that it's growing or because I have the impression that a few decades ago, Latin America was much more important in the public discussion in the U.S. and and the interest for the region has uh, vanished a bit. Um, even in at Stanford, we only have, have a handful of people, experts in in Latin America. Although it's just here next door, right? So, what what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, I'd say that maybe there's a decline of political interest. So people complain the U.S. doesn't pay enough attention what it should pay to, to Latin America, only pays attention when there are problems, okay, waves of migration coming from Central America, yeah, sort of um, whatever, when we had sort of Chavez or Maduro, sort of those kind of things, rather than broader issues, sort of day-to-day -day, uh, issues. I think in terms of academia, um, I still see a lot of interest. Um, so some, I did some research, others have done that, looking publications, this is sort of in my field, sort of like in political science. Um, you have more works on Latin America than on uh, whatever, South Asia. Um, so the proximity, um, in some sense, the ease of the language sort of Spanish is uh, relatively easy to pick up as a, as a second language. I think lots of people in the US academia study Latin America because you're starting to have, we've had democracy, yeah, sort of, you know, three decades, four decades. You start to have basic institutions and data that are similar to what have been used in the study of the United States. People are doing surveys and, um, so in some sense, sort of um, Latin America is sort of a, a very good laboratory, if you want, to, to test ideas. Um, and so some people would even say sort of within political science, Latin America is overrepresented in terms of if you look at publications um, in top journals. So, so I don't see that as a, as a problem or sort of that. Um, and, and I see it sort of, I'm not sure sort of just the trends over time, but sort of pretty pretty constant over time. So there's a strong group of people within the disciplines that have expertise in Latin America um, that are engaging in disciplinary debates using um, their knowledge about Latin American countries. That's um, so I'm pretty optimistic in terms of that. Yeah, sort of. Um, but I mean, sort of, you at Stanford, you have Beatriz Magaloni, who's a very distinguished uh, professor. It's sort of, so it's like, um, Yes, so, yes. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm glad to to hear that you're optimistic about that. I guess that 
sometimes we are just uh, seeing the glass uh, half empty, but uh, that's pretty good. I want to ask you more about Latin America in, in, in a bit, but um, I would like to focus for, for a while on, on your book because it's been a, um, a couple of weeks reading it and, and I found it pretty interesting. It is not about Latin America, it is about uh, critical junctures and probably we could start from there. Um, why don't you tell us what a critical juncture is and how has it become a sort of approach you could argue in, in the social sciences? Yeah, so um, as introduction to the book lays out, um, the study of critical junctures is part of uh, a broader trend within the social science to, to do more historical analysis. So we can look at what are the causes of the current situation by looking at what happened one, two, three, four, five years ago. Okay, sort of you look at immediate or sort of pretty proximate causes. And I think sort of people are studying history, part because sort of there's just rich data, so there's interesting variation, and we, we're interested in trends over time, sort of in economics, people talk about the great divergence, sort of this is in terms of economic, long-term process of economic development. What the critical juncture literature does that fits within sort of this broader sort of interest in historical analysis is that there are certain critical junctures, turning points. So I'll, I'll elaborate this a bit more, sort of sudden shifts that have long-term consequences, okay? Uh, so there's some period, sort of, you can say a critical juncture, the different ways you can sort of, sort of specify. It. It's a rapid change. Uh, it's a discontinuous change. So there's something really new that is introduced. Uh, a term that we use in the book is a qualitative break. So there's some big break, sort of, you can think about sort of, you know, the beginning of industrialization, colonial sort of, uh, the colonization of countries, the French Revolution, okay, big sudden changes. So th there's a, a certain kind of change that's the focus of attention. And then the idea being that that is a cause of something sort of that endures for quite a long time. Within economics, there's a lot of focus on persistence. Um, it's essentially the same idea sort of in the critical chunks as we talk about historical legacies. So there's a big change that has a long-term impact, things that are seen to endure uh, for decades, maybe even uh, centuries. So, so it's, it, critical juncture research combines two research, a certain kind of change, and that happened sort of in the past that, that, that then creates this long-term persistent uh, effect. Um, so this is important if we're trying to understand how do we think about the problems these days, different countries, what should we do? Um, so you can think about different variables that are the proximate things, maybe, well, change your institutions, change the policies, um, and sort of that's, that's sort of all fine and that's useful, but sometimes it's important to sort of think with more historical depth that some of the causes may be uh, distant. These, in some sense, they may be more structural, harder to change. And sort of if you're going to really analyze sort of the, the challenges and then think about sort of prescriptions, it's important to, to have that perspective uh, in mind. I was so, when I was reading the book, I was trying to think about what I would define as a critical juncture in the sense of, okay, I kind of understand the concept what type of events I would describe as a critical juncture or not. And I was trying to go through my limited knowledge of global history, trying to pin down like those events. And one of the elements that I probably struggled with was think about the right uh, time frame to think about this, right? So you were talking about um, the industrial revolution or so on, the industrialization of the world. And then I was thinking what should be considered here the critical juncture, right? Like the very granular event as the invention of the um, 
engine or so on, or like broader forces that you could still argue that are part of this, right? So when I was thinking about this, probably every important event has this series of micro um, events that ended up leading to the emergence of this, right? So we think about, I don't know, World War II or whatever, one can always think about the meeting or the call that two global leaders had at some point. Uh, and also if you zoom out, you can talk about larger forces that could have played out over decades, if not centuries, if one is having a very long durate type of, of, of framework. So how what's your take around that? How do you think that the literature deals with that? Is there a nuance that it's not worth uh, paying too much attention to? Uh, what's your, your take on, on, on that? So the idea of critical juncture is an abstract, very generic concept. Then if we're doing some kind of research project and I want to sort of know why certain countries are wealthy and others aren't. Yeah. I want to know why some are democratic, others are not. Sort of think of whatever the, the question, the outcome that you're interested in. Um, then this is sort of the theorizing. Yeah, sort of it's like, what is sort of the the long-term causes of of these of these events, um, and this is where you then you have a debate. So 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 you can say sort of I think the causes are historical. Okay, sort of, and maybe we all agree we need to look historically. Then the question is how far back do we go? Yes, um, some people say well let's look three decades ago. Whatever, there's a big change sort of neoliberalism. Yes, yeah, sort of we. We talk about that in Latin America and some other countries. There's a big economic restructuring. I think to understand the present, we need to sort of look at what changed in the 1980s into the 1990s. Um, others say, no, you need to go further back, yeah, sort of, um, okay, when you had sort of the transition to mass politics, incorporation of workers. This is fundamental to the work of David and Ruth Collier, shaping the political uh, arena. Others say, no, we need to go further back when states were formed um, in the 19th century. Um, this is in, in this, this volume that we're discussing, Sebastian Mazuka uh, makes an argument that that's what you need to sort of focus on to understand um, the diverse sort of uh, economic uh, fortunes of countries. Others, then we have sort of the <laughs> very well known as Imogdon Robinson, various others sort of, no, it's, it's colonialism. There was some colonial period, so that, that's taking us further back, yeah, sort of. Um, so in some cases, the age of discovery, sort of, you know, 1500s. I mean, that's where countries went off on different paths. So you can have sort of a debate who is right. So that's one way to take it as, as competing hypothesis. So, so that's very interesting, yeah, sort of, it's like, um, uh, wh which is sort of the most important turning point, sort of, um, okay, sort of, so so that's one way to think, uh, we think in terms of variables, which one is more important? Maybe all, everyone contributed, but one was more important. Those are things then we can test, yeah, I mean, sort of that's, uh, sort of that's, that's very interesting. We can think, some people say, it's like, it's like, if I'm right, you're wrong. So it's it's totally competing hypothesis. We can think maybe a supplementary. They're all sort of contributing uh, something. Uh, so that's where you start to get into interesting debates. Yeah, sort of. We agree that we we want to explain some outcome. Um, which are the historical roots, origins um, of some divergence that we're interested in? Um, the literature. I, I don't think has reached that point. There's some debates, yeah, sort of, I think, you know, this was a more important critical juncture than the other. Um, usually when we see the testing and sort of, so we have lots sort of in terms of quantitative testing, it's basically, I say, this is a critical juncture versus, you know, it doesn't matter, yeah, sort of. Um, so so we haven't gotten in the empiric sort of to that uh, that level, which I think is sort of, that's something that's opened up once you start doing this kind of uh, research. Um, we have some cases, I, I, the one that I found that goes the furthest back is Jared Diamond, yeah, sort of. So we have to go back to whatever. It's basically the, 
the Neolithic revolution, sort of 10,000 uh, more years ago. Um, so this is a debate, you know, sort of, if I start doing historical research, do I have to cover everything over the last 10,000 years? It's like, you know, don't tell me that. I don't want to do this research, then it's impossible. Yeah, sort of. So, but so then these are some sometimes sort of theoretical choices or sort of practical choices. Okay, I'm going to focus on the impact of some event, whatever, the Great Depression. Okay, what impact has the Great Depression uh, had? Yeah, sort of. And sort of the lingering impact it has. Right. Um, so those are the kind of debates that we have that it's similar to the rest of the science, you know, sort of I think it's sort of this factor or that factor. Um, historical research can be theorized in the same way and then sort of tested in the same way. Let, let me ask you about um, like the methodological approach there. And when you were describing like the Empirical challenges of the field you mentioned, well, the the, the quantitative challenges there. Um, but in the book, you describe this um, agenda as one that has been traditionally dominated by qualitative research, and in recent years, quantitative approaches have uh, become important. Right, I'm. I'm probably most familiar with the quantitative side of that and the literature on persistence. Yes. Um, but I would like to know then what uh, what has been the reception of that um, sub-agenda and the broader conversation on, on critical junctures. Is, uh, is people broadly happy with uh, the conventional persistence paper? Do they think that this quantitative approach is really adding something or not? What's the, the vibe of, of the community around this, this conversation? So I'd say in sociology, political science, um, starting in the 60s, 70s, research that was linked with, people talk about the broader field of co comparative historical analysis, the critical juncture, largely qualitative case-based. Barrington Moore is sort of a very sort of prominent uh, work on the origins of dictatorship and democracy that sort of uh, carried out uh, qualitative research. The book by David Collier, Ruth Collier, Shaping the Political Arena in 1991, basically takes eight countries in Latin America, a very sort of rigorous, uh, comparative, qualitative uh, analysis. We start to see sort of this is sort of in economics with cleometrics, with North, others in the 1960s. Um, people saying, well, this is good. Let's collect data. Let's have quantitative data. Let's analyze it. Yes. Um, that started. People did some interesting uh, studies. The paper, and this is, I mean, that's really sort of influenced sort of all fields, sort of Vasimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson. Um, 2001 paper on uh, the impact of colonialism um, uh, on economic uh, development. So that was sort of one of the first papers that said, hey, look, you, you can study these arguments uh, quantitatively. A lot of debate whether the instrument was the right one, but it's like that paper became a model. I think that's sort of what started a lot of then the quantitative um, uh, studies. Um, about long-term um, impacts. Um, they, they use the concept of critical juncture, and Jim Robinson contributes a paper um, to our volume. Um, others are using just persistence and not critical junctures. I think there's some differences, but broadly similar. I think the quantitative literature has taken off. Uh, it's becoming more and more important. It's, it started with economics, but more and more political science this are doing it. Um, we have sort of, in some sense, a new label sort of that people are using historical political economy. Um, there's a new volume coming out, an edited volume by Oxford. Um, it, it's largely political scientists, some economists, but that essentially sort of like, how can we study these issues um, quantitatively? So I think this is becoming more and more of a, uh, an active agenda. Um, I think people are reading it. I think they're 
they, they're finding it useful. Um, it's very intensive in terms of collecting data, yeah, sort of to have historical data. So, so there's some issues about the quality uh, of the data. So I think there's starting to be a dialogue between, look, we've been doing qualitative research and people continue to do that. But now we have a new literature. Are we talking the same language? Do these things combine? How might they combine? So one of the things that sort of um, in this volume with Collier we talk about sort of this is one of the new questions sort of how can we sort of combine, integrate the more quantitative and the more qualitative research? I would just say sort of one one thing for I me mean, first first that I think thinking about having both and how to combine them is the way to think about it. Uh, some people think that sort of with the quantitative it supersedes. It takes everything that the qualitative has and does it better. I think there's still advantages that the quantitative and the qualitative have. The studies, so I wrote a chapter sort of basically looking at the quantitative studies. Um, they, they basically carry out a regression, okay, that there's some distant event and you try and sort of connect it with sort of some very later uh, event. Um, the paper by Dell on Peru is just uh, fantastic. It's just like wonderful sort of, and shows actually the, the knowledge of the case sort of to be able to, to make some methodological choices. Um, even that one, which is actually more, has more data sort of uh, looks at persistence over like three points in time. Yeah, sort of. But so usually there's sort of, there's some very distant uh, effects, maybe some, the, some of the best papers on colonialism. Okay, the, differences in colonialism um, across countries, sort of within countries in India, um, how does that impact current situation? So you have like a big gap, sometimes a century, more than a century, sort of, with very little data in between. And so I think that's great, sort of that anchors you, sort of if you can find sort of your findings sort of that fit your argument. But sort of the qualitative researcher would say, great, I love that, yeah, sort of. Um, but but if you're making an argument that sort of some historical event had a long-term uh, impact, that historical event has ceased to recur. So, I mean, that's not changing, okay? The French Revolution happened, it ended. Colonialism happened, it ended. So you want to tell me, I mean, the big challenge is, like, how does that persist over time? So here we have various terms that are mechanisms of reproduction, mechanisms of transmission, the idea of path dependence is very crucial in terms of um, anchoring that idea. So what qualitative studies do is say sort of, does this change that happen? And these are the mechanisms of reproduction. Um, I need to study them over time, yeah, sort of, yeah, sort of, not just maybe at the end point or sort of, you know, at two points in time. So I want to see if those mechanisms of reproduction, and you can think of this sort of as a causal, as a causal argument, are happening over 50 years, for example. Sort of, in some sense, to connect, yeah, the historical event to the, the more current uh, outcome. So I think there's a difference there in terms of um, having data over more points in time um, that I haven't seen that yet in the quantitative studies. Um, I, I think that could be done uh, to make more plausible the argument that sort of this historical event, you know, is connected to this this particular uh, outcome. So I think that's an area where I think there's a lot of supplementarity. I could make another point about how people think about mechanisms. I think that's an interesting um, area for discussion as well. I would like to hear about that because um, I have the impression that at least in economics in the last couple of years or so, there has been um, probably even a strong pushback um, towards the persistence literature. Um, some of it comes precisely from what you're pointing out, which is that um, a good part of these papers seem to be uninterested or incapable of talking about mechanisms. 
Um, but probably there's a broader sense that at an aggregate level, we're struggling to extract very robust lessons in the sense that pretty much every type of exogenous shock or as we prefer to frame in, in this uh, quantitative persistence literature has been explored. And now we have evidence that pretty much everything could have like a persistent effect in the very long term. And then that opens the question to, well, if everything might matter, then probably nothing really matters, right? Um, and I guess that all these things are building up and that has increased the a skepticism towards this um, type of papers recently, which I somewhat shared to some point at the same time. I, 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 I really think that there are great papers and, and great insights from, from this literature, but it seems to me that you have the impression that maybe this qualitative literature could deal with some of those problems, right? And, and, and the, the study of mechanisms seems to be one of those avenues. Are you, is that a bit how you're seeing the, the future of, of the field? So let me make a, a theoretical and then sort of more methodological uh, point sort of. Um, so so I, I'm not, I haven't read sort of sort of the pushback that you're, you're suggesting. I can see that people have some problems with the persistence literature. One line of critique, and so this is the theoretical point, is that um, people say, well, this happened colonialism, and then there's path dependence. And, <laughs> and whatever, you wave your hands, path dependence, that's why you know you have the situation. You got into a problem, um, you couldn't get out of it, you, you had sort of some good sort of, you know, institutions, take the, that's the Morgan Robinson stuff on, on sort of economic development, and that's going to sort of, once you have sort of the right set of institutions, political, economic, um, that's going to be reproduced over time. Um, and you kind of wave your hands sort of. So people have said that what we have is uh, a sense of path dependent determinism. Um, so it's kind of whatever it's like, if you're thinking about sort of you're in a problematic situation, it's fatalistic. Well, so you had colonialism and you know, where maybe the wrong kind of colonialism and left some sort of negative um, institutions, um, you're stuck with that. Um, so people are saying, well, no, there could be, there could be change. There could be another critical juncture. So you can't just say sort of, okay, this happened and then things persist. So there's, I think, a very interesting literature. This has to do with the issue of agency and choice. Um, that in terms of the persistence, um, at every point in time, there are going to be some actors that would like to break with that equilibrium. Let me use that, that term. Yeah, sort of. Um, they would like to break. They would be better off with a different situation. Um, so to, to say that it persists, you need to actually say that sort of despite sort of, you know, efforts to break from an equilibrium, um, it, it persists. And obviously, I mean, sort of, you know, You've, you have critical junctures. You can have a, in the past. You can have a new critical juncture. Um, so you're not fated, sort of, to just see whatever outcome persists forever. Um, I, the, the quantitative studies, I don't think, deal with that issue. Um, but sort of in some of the broader theoretical debates, people are thinking about that. I think there's a very interesting discussion. It links a bit with what you said. Um, Critical juncture is a big sudden changes. And people say, well, those happen every now and then. Uh, what happens much more frequently is small incremental changes. So, yeah, maybe you're not going to see a change in the structure of the global economy. Okay, but you can maybe you're going to see sort of some small incremental changes. Those over time then may add up to something bigger or may trigger uh, a, a, a critical juncture. Um, a discontinuous change. So people are saying maybe this literature sort of has a very narrow understanding of change. It's, it only looks at big changes. When there are small changes happening the whole time. So I think one sort of challenge is how we connect the thinking about these big changes and sort of rare and sort of the much more 
common, incremental, gradual kind of changes. So, so I think that's sort of an important way to think about things. And sort of, yeah, well, we can't change the entire structure of the economy, whatever, that's maybe responsible for sort of poverty in Latin America, but you can make uh, some small changes, okay? So you break with sort of the fatalistic view of sort of, the, sort of things can't, can't be changed. Um, so I, I think that's sort of more sort of how we theorize about change and its impact. Um, and sort of there's a very interesting discussion, new literature, um, a lot in political science um, about incremental change, different forms of, uh, of incremental change. So I think there should be a dialogue between uh, those two, two literatures. The more methodological issue, and sort of the, this is how I react when I read sort of a lot of the quantitative literature, um, they do talk about mechanisms. Yes, yeah, so I find that people, that's part of the language. So you, you have uh, some initial change, you try and you know see if it's exogenous. You have an eventual outcome, and sort of there's something in the middle. Yeah, sort of, sort of. So people say, okay, there's this change that led to this outcome because it changed certain things in the middle. And sort of people talk about those as as causal mechanisms. The causal mechanisms that is sort of just straight intervening variables, which spell out the argument. Um, so it enriches the argument. Sometimes there's there's tests of those. Um, usually those tests are just like pretty simple regressions. Yeah, sort of they don't, so I haven't seen sort of things that really convince you sort of that it, it has a secondary role, you know, sort of. It's sort of interesting theoretically when you look at the empirics, it's like, well, you don't obviously think it's so that important because it's something that came at the end and you didn't really work it through uh, as much. I think the qualitative literature spends more time specifying the mechanisms, uh, but then studying them over time. Yeah, so this is, I mean, you can do historical sort of qualitative research, and we have a term that we use, process tracing. Yeah, sort of, so I'm going to see sort of in year one what happened, in year two, in, in year three, in year four, is some process that I sort of, you know, theorize as a mechanism uh, actually sort of, occurring as, as I basically say uh, it, it is. Uh, so, so that can actually sort of connect, sort of, you know, sort of like the beginning and the end point better than the quantitative literature does. If you take sort of, this is the Shaping the Political Arena by, by David and Ruth Collier, it's a 800 page book with eight cases and they sort of, so they're looking at the impact of the changes in the 30s for, cha for outcomes in the 70s. And they, I mean, they. This is dense historical research, analytical, uh, that links the changes in the '30s with eventual outcomes. Yeah, sort of coups or persistence of regimes um, is 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 their outcome. So, so I see more richer, uh, sort of fleshed out arguments with empirics in the qualitative literature than in the quantitative literature. So I think this is where there's actually quite a bit of complementarity, uh, I think. And, and I think it answers some of the questions that people may have. One of, just final point in terms of the mechanism, I think sort of, so, so in terms of the mechanisms, so I think this literature sort of has latched on to this idea of path dependence that comes from economists, David, Arthur, uh, North then sort of linked it sort of with institutional analysis. Um, the arguments tend to be biased, okay, because of this, some outcome is always going to be favored. Um, that sort of, and that they're not putting enough sort of, you know, emphasis on mechanisms that lead to destabilization. So there are mechanisms that explain why things are stable. So we have like the QWERTY example, sort of a classic example. You have a typewriter and stuff like that, even though you have one that's more efficient because people have sunk costs and all this kind of stuff. They have the habit, they're going to continue using sort of the QWERTY keyboard, even if that's not the most uh, efficient. But it seems like all of the arguments, it's like, I'm going to try and <laughs> give you as much evidence about why things should continue. And not thinking about sort of possible sort of, sort of alternatives that would destabilize, that would seek uh, change. 
So when people talk about mechanisms of reproduction, that they're, they're always sort of focusing on what would help reproduction, why things would persist, yeah, sort of. And then it's like, oh, things change, big surprise, yeah, sort of. Uh, rather than theorizing, well, no, there's always struggle, yeah, sort of. Um, there's always change happening. Um, so, so to think more sort of clearly about sort of um, this is the conflict between mechanisms that lead to persistence and, and stability, but sort of to think the possibility of change even within a sort of a pretty persistent uh, structure. There is something that I love about your answer on, on, on this question and, well, in general about our conversation in the book itself, which is this interdisciplinary approach and, and like you provide a view of how um, different disciplines might have some interesting insight to the broad conversation. And, and I think that's, a, I guess, a perspective that we should foster and, and cultivate more. And, and, and I love that about the book. And, and I have actually a, a, a question about that in, like from a practical point of view and in this role that you and David had as editors of bringing together people from different fields and different like professional trajectories, how did you manage to make it work? What how's the role of being an, an editor of of a volume that it's fairly large with so many people involved that is expected to provide a broad view of a complex yeah. topic, but still being coherent, having a kind of narrative arc uh, overall. How did you manage that? How did you contact the people? How did you make, I mean, how did you manage to make them fit the schedule? Tell me a bit about that. So it was a long process. Um, so we started with an initial meeting, a professional meeting of the American Political Science Association in 16. So it was like, and there wasn't an idea of a volume at that point in time. So it's like the process was like six years, uh, the entire process. Um, we had this conference to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the publication of David Collier's uh, Shaping the Political Arena. Um, so that was just like an open conversation. We had a panel, yeah, sort of. And then we said, oh, like, maybe we can do something with it. So we started to work and get people interested to write short papers. And then eventually the idea of a volume uh, emerged. In terms of recruiting people, it's like, I mean, it's networks, yeah. <laughs> so this is where networks are. And these are things that are accumulated over a long period of time. The contributors are mainly people that David Collier knew, some that I knew. Just I'll give you an example, sort of James Robinson, yeah, sort of, um, he had actually been teaching in economics at the University of Wyoming at USC, and he was recruited by political science um, at Berkeley. Um, so they actually had a, a joint seminar. I was visiting in 2000, so I actually sat in in one of these seminars in which they were reading books on critical junctures. Um, so David Collier, Ruth Collier, uh, and... Jim Robinson uh, was there, so so they knew each other. Then he moved on to to Harvard, not now now Chicago. So it's like people that you know. Uh, people there, there are lots sort of the main group is sort of Latin Americanists. There's some sociologists, Robert Fishman. These are people sort of that you've known professionally um, over over different points in time. With Fishman, so he had just published a book. On, on transition to democracy in the Iberian Peninsula, a comparison of Portugal and, um, and Spain. And he wasn't using the critical juncture framework explicitly, but he had similar ideas. So he said, it's like, oh, it's like, your book is like great, you know, sort of, it seems like you're saying sort of what we're trying to do without explicitly using the concept. Like, see if maybe you can reformulate sort of your work more explicitly in terms of um, this conceptual framework, yeah, sort of. Um, so, so that went back and forth sort of um, a lot of time, sort of refining things. We had panels at three consecutive um, 
conferences of the American Political Science Association. So, so with different papers, sort of we we basically d debated them, gave feedback um, over over three years, um, and then I mean, sort of, this is just the hard thing in terms of edited volume, sort of. Um, can you have some level of consistency and similar use of, not, I mean, concept, you can't regulate, but sort of more or less sort of that clearly sort of that they're tied together. And this is working back and forth a lot. So this is, we do this sort of, you know, um, sometimes through Zoom emails. Um, it takes sort of a lot of time um, sort of to, to do that. And it's like the author sending us a paper, David and I sort of would go through it, give comments, you know, sort of extensive comments. Um, so, so it's a pretty laborious uh, process. Um, I think that helps sort of it's more doable if you know the people ahead of time. Uh, if you have sort of a, lots of people for a volume and sort of like some of these Oxford handbooks that are gigantic, yeah, sort of, it's hard sort of for you to know everybody, sort of, um, so it's hard, and I mean, you can't sort of push somebody sort of, if, if you don't know them well, it's like, well, I think you could do this a bit better, you know, here's a suggestion, yeah, sort of, well, they can say yes, no, whatever. Um, but that has to do sort of with a sense of community that you're building. Y you do that sort of by having these meetings at one of the, the meetings that we had in Washington, D.C. This was American Political Science Association. So we, the day before, we had a, a working dinner. Um, so, so that's sort of, again, when we meet at these conferences, bring your sort of, you know, your collaborators together and sort of have, have people sort of discuss uh, papers, discuss it, then you have dinner sort of. So, so there's a social aspect to it, but sort of uh, having free, frequent uh, interactions. A lot of this happened during the pandemic, so the idea of having a a face to face conference day day and a half, uh, which would have that's I think the thing to do always. Um, we couldn't do that, yeah, sort of. Uh, so we had some Zoom interactions, but not uh, the standard uh, conference. Um, so that's a bit the story of. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, like I'm not sure that. People are aware of, like how much effort is behind some of the um, the collective endeavors in, in academia, right? Which are pretty much built in what you described, right? Like a subtle social attraction setting, you know, it's that like you could put everyone in a studio for a month and, and come up with a book, but it's a long process. Um, but the outcome is great. I, I, I really love the book and and I think they're like great lessons for um, not only for people thinking about critical junctures and persistence, but whoever is interested in history as uh, an important force behind uh, societal outcomes. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you decided to put the effort to bring together all the people and, and come up with this volume. Um, I would like to talk to you about something else before uh, finishing, and it's about Latin America, taking advantage of the opportunity that you're an expert on, on the region. I would like to hear your perception about the current juncture. How do you see the region from a political point of view, we have recently moved to what seemed a new pink tide or so. Um, my take on this was that it was a reaction from some exhaustion of, of the um, political alternatives that had dominated after a couple of decades and the protests that we saw in Chile, in Colombia, a couple of years ago, probably were a sign of that. However, I've been recently puzzled by the protests in, in Peru. The Peruvian case seems to be probably not fitting very well that broad trend. So I don't know, how, how, how do you think about that? Which 
countries do you think we should be paying more attention to? I don't know. What's what's your broad approach to the situation? Yeah, so I mean, the the picture is very diverse. Um, some some people give a very negative read of so the current situation. Um, I think there are problems, but they've actually been around, or the problems sort of take different forms. Yeah, sort of. If you go back to the 1990s, we had very weak governments that were falling. Yeah, sort of. So we had a one point in time that half of the the governments were not the elected ones. Yeah, sort of. There'd been an election, but that government collapsed. Yeah, sort of. This is when they were implementing free market reforms. Um, so the government would collapse in the face of protests. Yeah, sort of. So we had like two weak governments. Uh, then we had like two strong governments. And sort of, you think about Venezuela with Hugo Chavez, sort of like sort of. Uh, so Korea in in Ecuador, sort of like Korea in Ecuador, you had like three elected presidents that can't end their term. So they're too weak. Yeah, sort of. And then you go to one that's maybe too strong, yeah, sort of you go from one side to another. So the different problems, I don't know which one's worse. So I see different kind of problems over time. Not necessarily that things are getting worse. There's some countries definitely sort of, you know, things have gotten worse. But that's, I'd say sort of an overall positive, then I'll sort of add something a bit more than problematic. You had transitions to democracy in the 80s, 90s. Most of those regimes have endured. So never before have you had 30, 40 years of elections, competitive elections, alternation in power. So this is the first time in Latin America that it, this seems to be an equilibrium, a norm. Yeah, sort of. It's not high level, maybe sort of as we'd like, sort of high quality democracies, uh, how we talk about this, uh, but it's enduring, which wasn't the case ever before in the history of Latin America. So, so that's the positive. There's clearly a negative, and we're seeing this in protests, that there's a disconnect between the political leaders and society. We see this with the protests. We saw this in Colombia. We saw it in, in Ecuador. This is going back to 18, 19, the big protests starting in October of 19 in Chile. So there's a disconnect with the establishment, Yeah, if you want, sort of... Um, so you elect people, but they seem to be sort of very distant. In some countries, sort of in Argentina, they talk about a political caste. Yeah, so it's like, you know, um, very different, distant from the citizens. So people talk about a crisis of representation. And sort of you have these protests and sometimes you have repression. You have sort of a lot of repression um, in the case of, um, again, sort of Ecuador, Colombia. Uh, we're seeing it sort of, there are other, other things to it in Peru uh, right these days. So you have repression, yeah, which then adds to, uh, to the problem. So we're not having politicians that are legitimate, that are seen as representing citizens. So there are clearly problems with how, how democracy is working. Um, sometimes then you have sort of such frustrations that it leads to populist reactions. So, and I think that sort of put negative, sort of, if you take Bolsonaro, the things that he was doing in Brazil, um, take the case of El Salvador with, with Bukele. Uh, people are desperate for a solution to the problem of violence, sort of, he's basically using pretty autocratic methods to do it, but he's generating results. So he's like the most popular president in Latin America. So he's got about 60, 80% approval, uh, Boric, who was sort of like, you know, seen as a new person, sort of like new lead, face of leadership in Chile, has about like 20, 25% approval. So, so it's like, he's much more democratic in terms of his way of doing things, um, but it's not working politically in terms of like, you know, being whatever, gaining support of, of the population. So... This is sort of the problem we're having, sort of economic, but then sort of issues having to do with security. Um, does the government respond to what citizens uh, want? So we're seeing all sorts of um, problematic features. Um, the attempt at a coup, short-lived sort of 
of Peru with Castillo, and then this leading to this new government that sort of um, is creating sort of all sorts of problems. Um, I'd say sort of, I mean, again, you, you sort of, that's all negative. So the positive, so let me sort of end them with a the positive sort of. So, so what is the solution in Peru? Um, move elections forward fast. Yeah, sort of, so they, the, the way out is elections. Uh, people aren't saying, let's go back to military governments or sort of an all election, sort of people say elections, sort of you have to reconnect sort of, you know, with citizens approving, giving consent to who's governing. Um, you also have sort of change, yeah, sort of, sort of Lula was elected uh, in, in Brazil, even though they're seeing the problems that we're seeing there um, after the period of Bolsonaro, sort of, okay, first you had, I think this is very important, the opposition unified. Um, Lula and Fernando Cardoso had been competitors. Uh, they were like, so two key leaders. And Cardoso basically said, sort of, given the alternative, Bolsonaro, I support Lula. So you have oppositions that basically say the threat of some of these leaders is so big, let's set some of our differences aside, political, sort of personal it could be, um, let's unify. And sort of that's a big part of sort of then why uh, Lula won, one, one part of why Lula won, uh, won the election. Um, so problems are being solved in the case of Brazil through elections, yeah, sort of. I think the election of Lula, I see it in, in positive terms, needing alternation and sort of, um, I think the things that uh, Lula likes you to do, I put, issues with sort of some of the policies, you know, that he implemented in the past, sort of issues of corruption. I think that's, that's a big problem. But so, so I wouldn't say sort of, and sort of at pushback, um, Latin America has entered into a downward spiral and sort of, um, it's like a lot of noise. It gets better, it gets worse. I think in some cases, the political leadership is learning some lessons. I think an active civil society protesting is very good, very healthy. Um, sort of that's sort of a, an important check on uh, on on leaders. Um, so so I'd I'd give you sort of a mixed assessment. Um, sort of which shows, I mean, to be attentive. I mean, you ask sort of any particular country to to follow. Um, uh, Sort of, I mean, some cases, I mean, whatever, just are very negative and sort of, you know, Venezuela, Nicaragua, sort of, um, obviously you put Cuba sort of in terms of being non-democratic. Um, the two big countries is obviously Mexico and Brazil to look at. Yeah, sort of, um, I think sort of what happens in them is very important. So um, you've had sort of the election of, of Lula and now we're going to see sort of what's... Uh, what happens there. Mexico, there's the issue of sort of, does the government of Lopez Obrador curtail some of the, the autonomy of key institutions like the electoral authorities, the INE? Um, I see that as worrying. Um, recently, there was a pretty scandalous incident over the appointment of the head of the Supreme Court with one of the candidates very close to the government being involved in a plagiarism scandal, but uh, the person that was eventually elected is somebody who's pretty independent of the government. So th those are things sort of that, um, whatever that I, I pay attention to. That's great. I, I feel we should have another conversation just to talk about Latin America. Um, but um, I'm very glad we had the opportunity to um, bring together all these uh, topics, which uh, uh, was uh, fascinating in many ways. Um, I've noticed that you're a, a good um, a Twitter user and you share great advice on books and, and stuff. Uh, what's your, how can people like find you on Twitter? Um, basically, I mean, if you put my name, Gerardo Monk, um, my Twitter handle is at Gerardo Monk. Um, I only joined recently in August of last year. Um, I got exposed to what Twitter is. It's kind of a crazy place, but sort of tried to have then sort of more of a, an academic discussion. So I talk about books, um, 
in different fields, sometimes sort of I read a lot. So like, okay, if you're interested in this topic, these are six books that I think are useful. Sometimes some political commentary, but sort of not sort of accusatory sort of, um, um, sort of like I had a table, okay, like, you know, after the, 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 the incidents in Brazil, yeah, sort of people said the problems of democracy always come from the right, like Bolsonaro. People say, well, here's a table of sort of various crises from 1990 on. It sort of, it comes from both sides. I don't know. So, so that's using stuff that is part of my research to share, sort of. Um, I'll sort of share information about documentaries, other kind of things. Uh, but sort of um, uh, at Gerardo Monk, you'll, you'll find me there. That's great. Yeah, I... I mean, I think you contribute to make Twitter a less dirty place, um, which I think, I mean, if you use it wisely, I think actually it's a great source of information and even entertainment. I'm actually also very active on, on Twitter. People can find me as Javier Mejia say there. Um, but okay, let me thank you again. This was a, a lovely conversation, Gary. I hope to talk to you soon. Great talking to you, Javier. I enjoyed this a lot. Um, thanks a lot and keep up your, your good work.